Well, good evening, everyone. My name is John Highbush, and I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. And I just want to thank you all for coming out this evening. Quite appropriate for tonight, in honor of our men and women in uniform who defend our freedom around the world, if you'd please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Before we get started, I'd like to take just a moment to recognize some special guests that we have with us this evening. And I'll begin with our Ventura County Supervisor, Peter Foy. Peter, there you are. Thank you for coming, Peter. Ventura County Clerk and Recorder, Mark Lund. Mark. Simi Valley City Council members, Mike Judge, Keith Mashburn, and Steve Soika. Gentlemen. The new Simi Valley City Manager, Eric Levitt. Eric. And Ventura City Council member, James Monahan. Okay, so around the middle of the 1950s, there was a man known to all of you by the name of Ronald Reagan. For reasons that only he knew, he decided to quietly start a small collection of cards, note cards. And on them, as time went by from one decade to the next, he would scribble down quotations he'd read that he thought were instructive about life, ones worth remembering as he pursued his career. For over 40 years, he kept this collection to himself. From time to time, one of these life's rules or pearls of wisdom that he captured would find their way into one speech or another, whether he gave it before a small audience at GE when uh, he worked there for the company after he left Hollywood or whether he was governor of California or president of the United States. We were fortunate enough to find this collection of quotes when we set about to renovate the Reagan Museum a few years back. It had been hidden from the world, including his speechwriters, for many years. President Reagan would privately resort to the cards when a particular speech called for something especially important he'd captured and that he wanted to say. We've traced some of the quotations he collected to his announcement for his campaign for the presidency, his inaugural speeches, and other critical moments during his time in office. So with us today is an example of another very great man who has a lot in common with the remarkable Ronald Reagan. His name is Donald Rumsfeld. Now he, like President Reagan, has tirelessly served his country over a lifetime, having worked for four United States presidents and served in the toughest jobs public service has to offer. A member of Congress, a US ambassador to NATO, White House Chief of Staff, Secretary of Defense twice, the only such example in the history of the United States, and literally a dozen or more important federal advisory roles, several of which were for President Reagan. Thankfully for all of us, along the way, Secretary Rumsfeld had something else in common with President Reagan beyond duty to country. Right around the time that Ronald Reagan started squirreling away the gems he'd captured on cards for later use, Donald Rumsfeld began doing the exact same thing. Only his were stored in a shoebox <laughs> and contained much of his own wisdom, his own rules for leadership and management, strategy, life that he'd learned along the way. Now, I don't know if the original shoebox that he stored them in has survived all these years, but I know with certainty that the contents have. 
as his career skyrocketed over time. What started out as scribblings in a shoebox eventually migrated their way to memos, grew sizably, and have been distributed widely in one format or another to those who've had the privilege to work with him over the years. Thankfully, they've finally been captured in a book, organized in such a way that they will prove to be priceless pointers to everyone who's looking to lead in life, from college graduates to business leaders aspiring to be public servants. Secretary Rumsfeld has been kind enough to come to the Reagan Library to discuss his book, Rumsfeld's Rules, and I know he will be happy to answer some questions that you might have as well when his remarks are complete. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming back to the Reagan Library the definition of a true public servant, Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. My goodness, what a wonderful group here. Uh, John, thank you. It's, uh, you've got a terrific job. And I hope you appreciate it. I remember the author, McCullough, who wrote a wonderful book on President Truman, one time was testifying before Congress, and he, they asked him what he wished might be a little different in our country, and he said, I wish more students studied history, the history of our country. It's so important. And what you're doing here with this library and Nancy Reagan and so many of the people who are here who support this fine institution, uh, you're doing something important because it's important that we remember President Ronald Reagan and his role in this country. And so I, I thank all of you for supporting the institution and, and wish you well. Now, my mother was a school teacher. And some of you probably know how that is. I would ask her what a word meant, and she would say, well, write it down and look it up. <laughs> so I started carrying little cards like this. And I still do today, even though I'm going to be 81 in July. <laughs> and a great-grandfather in August. Think of that. <laughs> Someone told me once, Don, you've lived one-third of the history of our country. <laughs> I, I got out my abacus <laughs> and figured it out, and it's true. And of course, it says what a young country we have. <laughs> or what an old man I am. But she would tell me to write it down, look it up, and uh, I started doing that, and, and then I started collecting thoughts or ideas, or if I thought someone said something interesting or important, I would write it down. And uh, I would put it literally in a shoebox. And one day I was with President Ford, and he had the amazing experience, the unique experience of being the only man never elected president, never elected vice president, he came in towards the difficult end of the Vietnam War. The economy was in the tank. The reservoir of trust had been drained in the country. And we were in the, he called me back from NATO where I was ambassador and said, you, you chair my transition, please. And so I said, okay. And I made some comment, I forget what it was. I might have said to somebody, uh, stop saying, the White House is calling because buildings don't make phone calls <laughs> or something like that. And uh, he said, well, where does that come from? And I said, well, I collect this stuff. And he said, well, let me see it. So I had my secretary type up these little notes and I gave it to him and he said, circulate it, please circulate it to the White House staff because there's some interesting ideas there and they should know those things. And so I did and then pretty soon it took a life of its own and he called it Rumsfeld's Rules. My wife tells me confession's good for the soul. <laughs> and, and the truth is, they're not all Rumsfelds. They're, they're people like Sun Tzu and, and Winston Churchill and 
Mrs. Thatcher who said the trouble with socialism is that pretty soon you run out of other people's money. <laughs> <laughs> So I, uh, I started, people started asking for copies of these things, and I never thought much about pulling them together, but I would give a mimeograph. Some of you are old enough to remember what a mimeograph. <laughs> I bet you the few people here who know what a thermofax is, too. <laughs> that was before we had computers and, uh, or television. In any event, uh, it's been fun. I, I, I was here and, and had the wonderful hospitality of this institution when I wrote my book, Known and Unknown. And uh, in fact, that's one of the rules in there. One of the sayings is, is there are known knowns, the things we know we know. There are known unknowns, the things we know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns, the things that we don't know we don't know, and they are the ones that get you. <laughs> the, in any event, we pulled them together and, and uh, decided that we'd have a chapter on, oh, starting at the bottom. What do you do when you start out at the bottom? Well, you learn from those at the top and watch other people. I remember when I got out of the Navy and went to Washington working for a congressman, I'd go home at not, night and my stomach would be in knots. I'd never worked in an office. I was a good pilot. But, and uh, pretty soon you start watching what other people do and you learn how to do it. And uh, then I had a chapter on running meetings. And the first rule there is, do you really need the meeting? Think that over very carefully. You know, there's a pattern where people tend to have meetings and think that they've had, had decided something when, when in fact you don't. And uh, I'm a broken down ex-wrestler and I wrote a chapter on wrestling. Now, not all of you will find that interesting. But one of the interesting, the first thing I found interesting about wrestling was the relationship for a young person to learn the relationship between effort and results. You know, the harder you work, the luckier you are. And it, 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 it's so obvious that at the end of wrestling practice, it was time to go take a shower and go do your homework. But you didn't. If you really wanted to do something, you'd go out and run for two miles because you knew that you needed to be in better shape. And, and pretty soon, the, the more you work, the harder you work, the better you got. And, and that's a wonderful thing for a person to learn in anything when they're young. Um, I have a chapter in there on strategy, uh, which is something that's a word that's frequently overused, and uh, talk about that. And then there, there are some other chapters which I've enjoyed doing. And I hope that uh, people will have a chance to it's the kind of book you don't have to read through. You can thumb through it, look at a chapter, and, and come away with some thoughts and ideas. I've been, had a good time visiting with people on television and different groups about the book. And one of the book, one of the book questions people ask you is, well, Mr. Rumsfeld, what was the biggest mistake you ever made? <laughs> and you know, that, that's a... What I immediately flies to mind was Napoleon's comment when he said, I've made so many mistakes, I no longer blush from them. <laughs> and I guess that's true in life. We all do. And uh, sitting down in the front row here is an old Navy pilot. And uh, he'll remember that when you go to Pensacola Flight School, they stick you in a little airplane called an SNJ, and they give you a flight manual. And in the flight manual, it says, if you're lost, climb, conserve, and confess. <laughs> Think, about that. Think about that. What does it mean? It means get some altitude so you can glide to safety if you run out of fuel. Lean out your mixture. Take a deep breath and confess. Get on the radio and say, I am lost and I need help. I, when people ask me about the White House these days, I, <laughs> I, 
I, I kind of wish someone there had been a Navy pilot. <laughs> but it's good advice. We all get lost, and if you think about it, if you just stop and step back and, and get people in the room and say, I can't figure this out. You know, most of us, there, there may be a few Mozarts or Einsteins in this room who go off in a room and do something brilliant all by themselves, but all the rest of us, what we do, is we do it with other people. We, do it, we learn from other people, and we talk to other people, and I, as ideas go back and forth, pretty soon you, you kind of find your way. And uh, I really do think, when I think about some of the challenges that the national government has, that pausing is an important thing. I was uh, asked when I was confirmed for the Secretary of Defense in 2001, what I worried about the most. And when you go to bed at night, what bothers you? And I can remember, you know, all the things that race through your mind, Iran or North Korea or terrorism or one thing and another. And uh, my answer was, I worried most about intelligence. I worried about the fact that the country was at a period in its history where weapons were increasingly lethal but societies were closed, and it was very hard to really get ground truth as to what was happening in some of the countries in the world. And there was the problem of proliferation. And, uh, and my answer, I think it was the senator from Kansas asked me the question, I, my answer was that I worry about our intelligence capabilities, how tough it is, it's, it's a tough job. And our margin for error is much less because of the lethality of the weapons. During that period, the Johns Hopkins had had a study done, and it was called Dark Winter. And what it did was it theorized uh, that smallpox would be put in three locations in America, and the result would be that the contagion of that would result in up to a million deaths within a year in America. Uh, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when you got chicken pox, they used to stick a quarantine sign on your house, and you couldn't go out, and people couldn't go in, and you couldn't go to school, and you were in quarantine. And uh, can you imagine if, if that happened in our country without the fact that we're, our immunizations, those of us who still have them, uh, they're no longer effective, and it's a serious problem. And I, so you think about all of those things, and so... When I was out talking about my book, Known and Unknown, I went to Fort Leavenworth. And not the prison, the, <laughs> the military base. And um, someone asked me, I, I was speaking to 1,490 lieutenants, or majors they were. And they came from mostly our country, but from other countries too. And they, someone in the back asked me the same question. And this is you know, 2012, not 2001. And my answer was quite different. I, I went, when an, answering the question, I said the thing I worry about most is American weakness. I worry about the fact that during my adult life, the United States has had the, the strength to contribute to peace and stability in the world. And it's been a better world because of that. But that we were sending out signals today by managing our economy with these horrendous debts and deficits each year, trillions of dollars accumulating, and that that was sending a signal out to the world that the United States in the next decade was not going to be the factor, the presence, the capability, the deterrent, if you will, that we've been in the past. And they're talking about the sequestration uh, of funds in Washington, and, and they've already talked about 400 and I think 63 billion dollars, half a trillion dollars roughly, coming out of the defense budget over the next decade, and the sequestration would add another 500 billion dollars to pushing 900 to a trillion dollars out of the defense investment over the next decade. When I went to Washington in 1957 out of the Navy, we were United States in the Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson years 
was investing 10% of gross domestic product in defense. Today, we're investing 4% before we take out close to a trillion dollars. Our allies in Europe are now spending less than 2%. And the signal that's gone out to the world from that is that the United States is creating a vacuum. And that that vacuum will be filled, and it'll be filled by countries with people, individuals, organizations that have values totally different from ours. And I submit that that, that is what worries me the most, that we will be a, that things, weakness is provocative. It encourages people to do things they wouldn't think of doing, absent that weakness, abs absent that opportunity that they see. And there will be things happening in the world that, that wouldn't have happened had the United States stayed on a path that suggested that we were not in decline, that we were not going down. Remember one of the rules in the book, my wife's father said to me but when we were getting married, Don, if you're coasting, you're going downhill. <laughs> and uh, that's true. And, and it, it, what really affirmed this in my head was when Vice President Biden stood up and said, we're not in decline. Why did he say that? He said it because he knows that the world thinks we are. Do I think that it's written that that's going to happen? No, I've got a lot of confidence in the American people. I think that we've tended when things got bad and the pendulum got shoved too far one side, people get up and push it back. And I think that'll happen this time, but by golly, we better get going. <laughs> now with that, I'll stop and respond to questions. I'm told there are microphones here. Is that right? And people are somewhere in the, there's one. Now listen, I'm 81 in July. I don't want, it's late at night. I don't, I've been on the road for two, a week and a half. I don't want anyone to ask me a five part question. One at a time. <laughs> There's a microphone. Here's a microphone. There's a microphone. There's a hand. I always worry about the first question. When they're that eager, it scares me to death. <laughs> right there. Here's your microphone. Right there. Good. Mr. Secretary, I heard a very learned person, a former Navy pilot and Rhodes Scholar, who said that he thought if democracy does not work in Iraq, that it will be the demise of the Republican Party in the United States. What do you think of that? Interesting, I've never heard that. Um, I think it's uh, nonsense. Is that Rhodes Scholar here? I'd like to see him. <laughs> Good, goodness knows I wasn't one, but, but uh, I, I got a lot of respect for any Navy pilot. No, I say it's nonsense because, first of all, uh, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, countries all across the globe evolve over time. We evolved over time. Look at us. What we are today, we think, is what ought to be. We, we, we would characterize us as good on a relative basis with the world. But were we good? No. We had slaves into the 1800s. We had a civil war. 600,000 Americans killed. My golly, think of that. Women didn't vote into the 1900s. We've evolved. And they're going to evolve. The Iraqis have a tough situation. They've got difficult neighbors. They have ethnic divisions that are, um, they've got the Kurds in the north, they've got the Sunnis and the Shia that historically don't agree. People talk about the Sunni-Shia divide in the world, that, that it's coming to a head. The, uh, they have no experience with democracy. Um, the, United States government in the 90s voted for regime change in Iraq. Democrat Congress, House and Senate, Democrat President Bill Clinton. He signed the regime change in Iraq. President Bush came in and went to the Congress and 
provided the intelligence and the information and the logic, and it was supported by Se Senator Clinton, by Senator Kerry, Senator Rockefeller, the head of the Intelligence Committee, said that there's an imminent threat. Saddam Hussein had used chemical weapons against his own people, the Kurds. He'd used them against the Iranians. He was known as the Butcher of Baghdad. The killing fields were enormous, the burial grounds. Tens and tens and tens of thousands of people killed. Now, is it a perfect democracy? No. Is it ever going to be? I don't know. Do they have a chance? You bet. Are they better off with Saddam Hussein gone? Sure, they've elected a president, prime minister, they've elected a parliament. Are they going to struggle? Is it going to be bumpy? You bet. Will they ever have a democracy that we would sit down and say, well, gee, that's because it's like ours, it's right. No, they've got different languages, different history, different culture, different neighbors, different neighborhood. No, I'd, I'd send the uh, Rhodes Scholar back to England for another. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's probably a good guy if he's a Navy pilot. No, I don't know how it's going to come out, but they're a whale of a lot better off today than they were. And, and God bless the men and women who went over there and, and uh, it, it performed that, that impressive. I'm going to have the people with the mics decide who should ask the next question. And all I can say is, don't mess up. Because the lights are in my eye and I can't see really very well. Yes, okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm a teacher also, and my children have the blessing and the curse of being <laughs> listening. Um, so I'm not going to ask you your biggest mistake, but... Um, You'll never make it in the press. Right. <laughs> but um, besides listening to your mom, um, what is your particular achievement from your career that you are most proud of, and what is it? You, you know, um, I've, I've volunteered for three things in my life. One was to go in the Navy, another was to run for Congress, and another was to marry my wife. And I would say it would be the latter. <laughs> we went to high school together, and she should have known better. <laughs> what, did I, what did we know at 22 years old? We've been married 59 years. Someone said to her, how in the world did you stay married to Rumsfeld for 59 years? And she said, he travels a lot. <laughs> yeah, I thought she was kidding. No, I think she was serious. Where, where's the mic now? There we go. It has always interested me. What is your impression of a man named Ahmed Chalabi? Chalabi was a, is uh, an Iraqi. He had left the country and spent a good deal of time outside. People who knew him kind of described him as the Michael Jordan of Iraq in terms of skill and, and deafness and so forth. I never knew him well. I've met him probably once or twice in my life. There was a tug of war within our government, which is not a bad thing, differences of view. And uh, my view and the view of some others was that we should pass responsibilities to Iraqis for Iraq rather soon, rather than later. Others felt that if any responsibility for governing Iraq was passed early, it would end up in the hands of expatriates like Chalabi. And uh, therefore, they favored, and of course, the people that were still in Iraq in large measure were either Ba'athists and cooperating with Saddam Hussein, or rather well down the line. 
the expatriates who'd been out and were opposed uh, Saddam Hussein and couldn't stay in the country or they'd be killed or imprisoned um, were different. So because Chalabi was very active with the expatriates, he happened to be, for some reason, uh, opposed strongly by CIA and the Department of State. Uh, I, as I say, I didn't know him particularly at all, but he was one of these highly active expatriates who would have very likely ended up with responsibility had responsibility been passed early. As it turns out, the Coalition Provisional Authority decided to put him in charge of what was called the debathification process in Iraq, which was kind of like the denazification process in Germany after the World War II, where they decided that any senior Nazi would not be a likely person to take responsibility in, in post-World War II Germany. And the problem was that if you had any kind of a job in Iraq, you darn well had to be a Baathist. The school teachers had to be Baathists. And so the administration of the debathification process was put in the hands of Chalabi by the Bremer, the coalition provisional authority head. It turned out that Chalabi, as smart as they say he was, uh, in my view, didn't do it as well as it might have been done. Now, that's 2020 hindsight. Uh, I wasn't there, I didn't walk in his shoes, and I can't be terribly critical, but, but I felt that we hurt ourselves by disallowing too many people from participating in the post-Saddam Hussein government. And, uh, and I would attribute that, uh, I guess, to Chalabi, who was in charge of it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Is he related to you or anything? <laughs> you never know. Who's got the mics? I can't see. There you go. Yes, sir. Mr. Secretary, let me take you back uh, domestically to uh, 1975, 1976. Uh, I, I hate to use the word assume, but I would assume that President Ford asked you for advice on the pardoning of President Nixon. Your assumption would be inaccurate. Really? Yeah. No uh, I, what happened was I, he asked me to come back and share his transition. I flew from Europe to the United States went into the Oval Office. He had already announced he was going to keep his, the Nixon cabinet. He had already announced he was going to keep the White House staff. He faced a dilemma between continuity and change. And, and he was persuaded by the Nixon staff, basically, that, that continuity was needed, that the world needed to be reassured that this man who nobody knew, who hadn't been elected, either office, uh, would continue on the path of the Nixon foreign policy, for example. And he knew that, and this is a wonderful human being, Gerald Ford. I mean, talk about basic human decency. This is, was just a fine, fine man. He also knew that if he let people go, he had a feeling it would look like they were complicit with Watergate or had done something they shouldn't have done. And because of his kindness and graciousness, he kept them. I came in, uh, and by the time I got there, he had gone out the night before and said he was going to keep the foreign policy and the foreign policy team. He had already announced he was going to keep the chief of staff in the White House and the cabinet. And I looked him in the eye and said, big mistake. He was the only president who was a personal friend. We'd served in Congress together. I'd managed his campaign along with Bob Griffin for minority leader back in the 1960s, and, and we were close personal friends. And I said, just flat mistake. And he gave me the old rummy, let me tell you why, and this and that, and, and uh, I said to him, look, the reservoir of trust had been drained in this country. Continuity is, is useful, and I understand that, and you've just climbed into an airplane that's flying 500 miles an hour, and you don't even know the crew. Tough job. But by golly, the American people want to be reassured that it's going to be a change, that there will be a, Nix, a Ford administration and not a Nixon Ford administration. And the only way you can do that is to get your team together. And it will be the kindest, most gracious thing you can do because what you will be doing is saying, it's not that you're letting someone go because they were complicit in Watergate. 
You're letting people go because, by golly, you're the president, and you want to have fresh team, and you want to tackle this, and you want to have the country get out of Watergate and get on with life. And he said, and the other thing he did, he said, we're going to have a spokes of the wheel White House where all the people report into me. And uh, I said, well, you're going to do it without me. Uh, the only thing that happens in the, where the spokes of the wheel comes in is the grease gets overheated and has to be replaced. <laughs> and uh, so I went back to Belgium. And uh, during that period, there's a good book on this by Jim Cannon that describes the entire pardon process. Uh, during that period, he talked to a very few people, three or four people, made his decision, did it for all the best reasons in the world. Everyone criticized him. He dropped something like 30 points in the polls. And, uh, and years later, he gets the Profile and Courage Award from the Kennedy Institute. I mean, did he do the right thing? I, I, I think he probably did. Um, if he'd asked me would I have recommended it, no. Uh, I would have said, gee, there's got to be a, nothing wrong with doing it eventually, but holy mackerel. What a jar for the people. It, would just, it, it just floored the people because it, it was announced on a Sunday morning. No idea that it was going to happen. And he, he really hurt himself. And in hurting himself, he hurt his leadership ability for a period. And uh, so I went back to Belgium. I was in Belgium, and he did it. And then my dad died in September, I guess. He came in in August. It was in September. And and uh, he called me up when he knew I was in the country, and he said, come and see me. I'm going to have to do basically what you said. I'm going to have to replace the cabinet and replace some of the Nixon staff, not because they'd done anything wrong, but because he needed his team. And, uh, and he, was in, he was down, and Betty had cancer, and the pardon thing had hurt, and he, and he had to turn around. It, he, He'd already announced, made these announcements, and he had to turn around, and it was hard. And I uh, told him I didn't want to do it, and I wouldn't do it on the basis of spokes of the wheel, because I thought it was a dysfunctional White House, and it would just hurt everybody. And he said, okay, I get it, and uh, we'll do it the right way, but let me, give me a month or two to turn around. I can't turn around that fast. And, and so I agreed to come back and became chief of staff of the White House. It was the toughest job I ever had. And you could not have worked with a finer, more really, truly decent human being than Gerald R. Ford. Thank you. It's a pleasure to ask you a question. I share your concern about the federal deficit, which is about $15 trillion now. If you were president of the United States, what strategies would you implement to reduce the federal deficit and eventually pay off the debt. Well, you know, Willie Sutton, when he was robbing banks, they said, why did you do that? And he said, he, that's where the money is. <laughs> and it doesn't take a genius. You, you, you'd have to go after entitlements. You don't have a choice. It would, we don't have a choice. We are imposing debts on future generations that are horrendous. I served in Congress in the 60s, and I was there when the first 100 billion dollar budget was proposed during Lyndon Johnson. The first one, and people gasped. A budget of a hundred billion dollars. A hundred billion dollar budget. Now, my goodness, they spill that much on the way to work. <laughs> you know, all of you are involved in your own lives, and you know how you spend your own money. You also probably are involved in a business or you watch government and see how it spends money or a nonprofit. And the hard truth is we're all human beings. We don't spend other people's money the way we spend our money. It's other people's money. And it's different. And, and it's true in a corporation, but it is really true in government. And it is, there is so much waste in government. And it is not going to take, it's not a big problem to get the budget back into balance and, and to begin to work down the debt somewhat. Uh, you know, I haven't taken Economics 101 for a good many years, but by golly, you, you can't keep flooding that 
so much money out there, eventually you're going to have to pay it off, and you're going to pay it off with inflation. Seems to me. I, uh, I think that, I mean, just give you an example. The, 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 in the Pentagon, in all across government, and, and there are people here from state and local government, but if, if you begin with the premise that the first responsibility is an individual and a family, the, the next responsibility is at the local level. It's closest to the people. And if something can be done there, that's where it ought to be done. The next level is the state government. It's farther away. It really gets to be other people's money. But uh, if, you can't, if you can't do it at the state level, at the local level, do it at the state level. The last choice is to do it at the federal level. And uh, I'll give you an example from the Pentagon. I know something about it. <laughs> when, when I was there, I, I started noticing what was happening. If you wanted something done in the Pentagon, you'd go for a person in uniform. Why? You can order him in, and when the job's done, send him away. It's not complicated. The second thing you'd do is you'd get a contractor. You'd make a contract, bring somebody in to do the job, and then the contract's over and he goes away. The last thing you do is go to a civilian employee in the Department of Defense. <laughs> Why? There's 17 different personnel systems. You can't hire, you can't fire, you can't move around, and, and so nobody wants to use them. Now, is that an overstatement? Yes. It is an overstatement. There's a lot of wonderful people in there on the civilian side. To be sure, no question about it. However, when I was there, I decided that we needed to be able to manage these people rather than misuse military people and, and misuse contractors. So I said, gee, let's get a personnel system that might work. And we went to the Congress. We talked them into doing it. President Bush agreed to sign it. We got a national security personnel system in that, that the unions hated it. And the reason they did was I admittedly did something outrageous. I, we imposed a concept of pay for performance. <laughs> Can you imagine? Outrageous. Well, I was gone by three years. It was rollback. We, I didn't get all, all I wanted in the first place. But by the time I'd been out three or four years, it was all rolled back to where it was. So the first thing you could do if you want to save some money in the government and answer to your question, just don't replace the first one out of every 10 civilian employees in the Department of Defense and see how you do. How's it going? Can we manage this place without them? Probably. Just a guess. <laughs> and I'd add, I don't think we need the service secretaries anymore either. I think that we now have a single department. Uh, they have important histories. And, uh, and it's, it's debatable. But I think there's a good case that could be made today that, that uh, since the Department of Defense is a single department, uh, we, we can pull it together and do more. You know, what? no one of those services can succeed all by itself. It, it, the leverage that's achieved by joint operations where the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines work together is just enormous. It's, it's a geometric. Uh, addition in our strength. And I would think you could probably do that if you wanted to. Um, but um, there, there's so many ways, oh my goodness, are there ways to save money. Question. Yes, where I don't see a mic. I'm lost. All the people with mics are pointing at each, oh no, there you are. Good, you speak up. I'm from Royal, uh, Royal High School. Um, my question is regarding young, per young people, because I am young. Um, and so I'm wondering... I used to be. Yeah. <laughs> it's relative. <laughs> um, but my question is, with most media being totally liberal and reporting things uh, like Benghazi as such, how do you convince young people that we just can't cut military? Um, you know, how do you convince people when the information they're getting, the intelligence that they're getting basically is skewed. Yeah. Well, I guess that's, that's a hard thing. Um, my, my wife had a rule about the media. Her rule was, Don, 
avoid infatuation with the press and resentment of the press. They have their job and you have yours. Pretty sensible. The free press is just a critically important thing in a democracy. And of course, free people are free to do things well. They're free to do them badly. They're free to make mistakes. They're free to be wise. And uh, we all go through cycles. And, and certainly, there's an element of truth in what you've said. But what we have to do is to be willing to engage in the conceptual arguments. We have to be willing to discuss these things and talk about them. And I don't know, you know, persuasion is critically important for political people. And, and uh, to be persuasive, you have to be seen as truthful and accurate. Uh, to the extent you're not seen as uh, accurate, um, you, you aren't as persuasive as you otherwise would be. And of course, to the extent you've got people drumming the, beating the drum on one side and you're arguing on a different side, it's hard. And I, I concede that. But, but I think history, I go back to what David McCullough said, the, the way we would do what you said, which is important, it seems to me, is to go back in history. At the end of World War II, we drew down our military, and the Korean War came up, and we had to ramp it up. And if you talk to the people in the military, they'll tell you two things. They called it the bathtub, and they know that that is the least efficient way to do anything. You're much better with a steady state. Instead of ramping it down and then having to ramp it up, which is terribly inefficient. Did the same thing after Korea, same thing after Vietnam. At the end of the Cold War, the last two years of the Herbert Walker Bush administration and the eight years of the Clinton administration, a deep bathtub, a decade. And each president and the country is left with the capabilities that are developed by their predecessors. Uh, what you do during your time in office as a president by way of defense investment it really doesn't benefit you much while you're there. It, 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 it takes time. And um, the, the reality is that, uh, I mean, the, the, the Desert War in, 19, in the early 1990s, they used a tank that I approved in 1975, the M1A1 tank. I might say over the objection of the army. They, there was a big debate, should we have 105 howitzer like we've always had or should we have 120 millimeter like the Europeans, uh, Germans have, the other big tank country. Should we have a diesel engine like we've always have or should we have a turbine engine for the first time in history? And uh, I ended up going with the 120 millimeter and the turbine engine and it performed very well but the army opposed it. Uh, when I was with this last time, I opposed the Crusader artillery piece, which took two giant cargo planes to move it and uh, put the money into precision artillery, which uh, uh, has done a superb job for us. So the, the, um, the answer is you have to be willing to debate, you have to be willing to talk about it, and if you go back in history, anyone who has been around for any of those experiences will tell you that, that we hurt ourselves. We hurt ourselves in two ways. We did it by drawing down and then having to ramp up. We wasted money, we wasted time, and we sent the wrong signals when we were doing the drawdown. We were sending the signal to the rest of the world. It's free play. We're not gonna be a participant. Does that come close? The other thing you have to do, it seems to me, is all of us, there's a tendency for individuals to think, I'm just one person, what can I do? And the answer is you can do a lot. I mean, that's what this, this experiment, I shouldn't call it a system, it's an experiment still, what we're doing in this country, where the people guide and direct the course of the country. And it's an it's a important experiment, but it's an experiment, and it depends on the active involvement of everybody. And when someone's being unfairly uh, attacked, standing up and defend them. When you see something in the press you don't like, writing a letter to the editor. When you really get upset, run for public office. <laughs> yeah. 
You know, it's awfully easy to sit back and say, why don't they do this or why don't they do that? But by golly, when somebody sticks their neck up, and you know, the first rule of politics is you can't win if you're not on the ticket. It's not complicated. Second rule is if you run, you may lose. <laughs> but if you don't run, you, you, you don't get into it. And I think that people have to recognize how much power we have as, in, as individuals. And the local officials here tonight, tonight know that. They know that, that what individuals do is important. I'll tell you, I, um, there was a professor at Harvard named Ed Banfield. He, he, uh, he wrote books and brilliant guy. I doubt if he was a Rhodes Scholar, but <laughs> just kidding. Uh, and, and I didn't know him well, but the New York Times Magazine section wrote a terrible article about me when I was running the uh, Office of Economic Opportunity. And it was really a hatchet job. He didn't call me up. I'd met him once or twice. I got a copy of a letter, personally typed that Sunday, I'm sure, probably with two fingers, <laughs> with some mistakes. And it's, it was a copy of a letter from Dr. Banfield to the New York Times and said, we had talked about the fact that I would do five articles for the New York Times. This letter is to tell you I decline. I will not do it. I don't want to be associated with a newspaper that writes that kind of a rotten article about such a fine public servant. Now, can you imagine what that did for me? And you can do that. And we need to do that. We need to stand up for what we believe and talk about it and, and not say, well, I'm just one person. I'm just one vote. Question. I, I'm not the picker. I'd be glad to go with you, but, but no one, they don't want you to ask a question because no one with a mic will come near you. Here, no, there, look at he's up, he's begging, he wants it. There we go. Uh, Mr. Secretary, what do you think of the Benghazi situation? Question is Benghazi. I think that if we're gonna put people in outposts, we ought to provide the security for them. If we can't provide the security, we ought to take them out. The Brits knew the threat. They knew precisely that Al-Qaeda-related terrorist organizations were in the neighborhood and that they were heavily armed. And the Brits pulled their people out of Benghazi. The United States people in Benghazi knew the threat. They knew there were Al-Qaeda-related organizations heavily armed, and they asked for additional assistance and didn't get it. Um, second, what I think about Benghazi. I, I think that the idea that the President of the United States, with, within a matter of hours, would go off to Las Vegas and give a speech uh, was unusual. Sometimes I understate for emphasis. <laughs> that he then would go to the United Nations and tell the United Nations that it was a spontaneous demonstrated demonstration related to a YouTube video, he had to have known that that was not the case. His people had talked to the number two man on the phone. He told them what was going on. It was not a mystery. For Secretary Clinton to then go to the families of those that have been killed and promise that the United States would seek out and find the man who did the YouTube video and punish him, even though by then everyone in the world knew it had nothing to do with the YouTube video. It, it, it reminded me of Mark Twain, Samuel Clements's book, Huckleberry Finn, where he said, you can't pray a lie. And, and, and as badly as election was going on, admittedly, and as badly as someone wanted the narrative to be that Al-Qaeda was dead and so Osama bin Laden was dead and things were going to be okay, 
what happened there didn't fit the narrative. And the arguments that were put out fit the narrative, even though it wasn't the case. Now, when, when you go back to the SNJ, you've got to climb, conserve, and confess. If, if you put out information, any of us do, that, is, that turns out not to be true, sometimes it's, it's, it's honor, honestly put out, and it turns out to be wrong, but you can't keep doing it. And you can't do it on a number of things. Uh, because what happens is your trust, the trust is eroded. And your leverage, your power, your ability to lead is eroded. And, and listen, I've been in the White House, and I'll tell you, it's a, those are tough jobs that the president has and, and the staff and the cabinet officers. And, and let there be no doubt those are tough jobs. And when you have something big like Benghazi on your plate, it's like having one pea on your knife. You don't want to drop it. And then, by golly, you get the IRS. And now, now you don't have two peas on your knife. You've got about 15. And then you've got the Associated Press. And it's a perfect storm. It's hard. And, um, and of them all, the IRS situation, uh, I, I think that goes so fundamentally against what the American people believe in. The idea that government, because we know how big it is. I mean, I, I, you know, Washington, D.C., you drive through the town, you, you, in, in look in any direction, and you can see eight cranes building. The place is booming. I mean, the, ho the housing market's high. The, the employees are being, there's seven of the richest county, counties in America are right around Washington, D.C. Other people's money. Washington, D.C. has been described as 60 square miles surrounded by reality. <laughs> That's what I think about Benghazi. I think it's unfortunate. Yes. There's a mic. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. A question I have is recently you've been discussing the fact of your relationship with Dr. Kissinger and that he's been talking to you and apologizing over and over again for some of the comments he made made. Looking at what light, what's happening with the current administration, my question is, is the State Department and the Department of Defense always at odds for over these years, or they really have at odds each other? Um, first, Kissinger. When he wrote a book, he sent it to me and he autographed it. He said, to Don Rumsfeld, an occasional adversary and a permanent friend. He calls me up about every six, eight, 10, 12 months and he says, Don. I say, Henry, I know why you're calling. Some of the classified tapes from his telephone conversations are gonna be released by the government. And in them, he says some things about me that I probably wouldn't have said about myself. <laughs> and I say to Henry not to worry. I said, by golly, Henry, I probably said roughly the same thing about you, but I didn't tape my phone calls. <laughs> God bless him, he's got a nice blurb on the back of my book. I'm going to his 90th birthday party next month. He's a very good friend. And the short answer to your question is, sure, there are differences. It's, it's not egos. It's not being at odds. It's the fact that they're differing perspectives. They each have large uh, professional uh, in people under them, the Foreign Service and the military. They each have different committees in the Congress that oversee them, that have big turf fights and preferences. But if you go back in history, if you think about it, my friend George Schultz, who also has a blurb on the back of the book, uh, he used to have differences with, Jim, uh, with um, Cap Weinberger, and you'd read about it in the press, and, and uh, in the Reagan administration. You think about the differences between Brzezinski and Cyrus Vance, uh, or the differences in the press, the differences between Kissinger and Schlesinger when he was at Defense and State. And it, 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 it's the, for, for one thing, the press likes to do that. They like to personalize things, and, and substance is complicated. So they, they make it personalities. 
And it isn't always personalities. It may be a difference of perspectives. And, uh, and certainly the differences Henry and I had, I mean, this is a brilliant man, Henry Kissinger. He's a terrific talent and a, was an enormous asset for this country and still is. He's a, he's a, a special brain, as is George Schultz and, and uh, even Jim Schlesinger, who didn't do well with Kissinger. The two didn't agree on things. Jim, I was with Jim the other day and he's just an enormously intelligent man. But, but the press overplays the personalities and uh, underplays the less interesting things, which is the substance. Think of that. that, that that's what it's about. Question. Yes. Okay, so this is going to be our last question so we can get up to the book signing. Boy, it better be a good one. <laughs> you are really on the griddle now. If you were currently the Secretary of Defense, how would you advise the President with regards to Syria? <laughs> Who has a mic? <laughs> you know, one of the rules is, if you don't know, say you don't know. And that, let, me, let me just take a minute on that. The situation in Syria is complicated. I used to deal with this fellow Assad's father, and um, he was, uh, he'd killed, I guess, 20 or 30,000 people in Hama, not before, while well, he was in office. And um, he's not someone that you would want to support in public office. The son was described by Mrs. Clinton as a reformer. He's so far as I guess killed, what, 70,000 people in Syria in the, in the war? Uh, he's not a reformer. He's got a lot of very tough apples left over from his father's regime under him. What do I think you'd advise the president? Well, I'd go back to Egypt and say, let's look at that. There were a lot of wonderful people that went into the square and eventually caused the downfall of the Mubarak government. And it, with that crowd uh, was a full spectrum. You had people who were reformers. You had young people who wanted better jobs. You had, you know, what's the unemployment in Egypt for men between the age of 17 and 30 or 40? You know, it's got to be 25, 35%, 40%. Terrible. They, they look on television and they see all the opportunity in the world and they think, my golly, we ought to have some of that opportunity. And, and your heart goes out when you see them, thinking that, by golly, we're going to do something and it's going to be better. And in that spectrum also are some extremists, and is the Muslim Brotherhood, which the director of national intelligence once described as secular. Um, in any event, among that group were some good people and some bad people. And the earlier there was an election, the more likely the winner would be the people who were the best organized, the toughest, the most brutal, and the most determined, the Muslim Brotherhood. And the United States, when, when they threw things at Mrs. Clinton in Alexandria, people looked at that and we said, gee, that's too bad. Who were those people? Were they bad people? They were not bad people, they were the good people, they were the liberals, they were the ones that feel that the United States put their thumb on the scale. Like in the old butcher shop, some of you don't remember that, you, you worried that the butcher put his thumb on the scale. They, they feel we helped the Muslim Brotherhood and let them down. What has that got to do with Syria? The answer, the reason I don't know what I'd do is I don't know what that mix is. I do know that there are bad guys in there, in the mix, and I do know there are good people in there, but I don't know who's the best organized, I don't know who's gonna prevail, and I don't know, I don't think you tear down what is until you got something better, and I don't know what, I don't know what's better, and I don't know how you could be sure that what's better would get there. So, and I, I, I'm, out of government. I just simply do not know what that answer is. I wish I did, but I think we'd have to be, I, I sympathize with the President of the United States and the people wrestling with that, 
because it's complicated, and they have a very recent example of doing it poorly. And think about it, in Egypt, I mean. If four people come down the elevator at night, and three of them don't know what they want to do, and one of them wants to go to the movies, they go to the movies. And by golly, there are people in that mix that do know what they want to do. And, and those people are not friends of ours. And they're tough, and they're determined, and they're well supported from outside. And it, it, making a judgment on that is not going to be easy, and I, I uh, empathize with the people in the White House and the State Department and the Defense Department in wrestling with that issue because it, it's, it's got to be very complicated, in, in my view. As little respect as I have for, for Assad, um, which I do have to say I, I have a very minimum of high regard for him. <laughs> and with that, I will say thank you. I appreciate your being here.